So um, today we're going to continue our discussion of path integrals with um, talking about fermionic path integrals. So what we did in the last lecture, so lecture 19, was that we introduced interactions in the path integral in the context of uh, formal but exact equations called um, called Schrodinger-Dyson equations. They are the analogs of quote-unquote classical equations of motion in quantum mechanics, equations of motion in quantum mechanics. And they will give us, uh, they do give us formal relations between that relate all correlation functions, various point correlation functions. And then we also discuss Feynman diagrams, the perturbation theory set up um, that we set up to calculate things in small coupling regime. All right, so let's go over that. Um, uh, this is the generating functional for an interacting scalar field theory. So we 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 for sim for simplicity we start with scalar fields, and um, here's the path integral over all fields, right? E to the power of i half integral. This is the free Lagrangian, right? So that integrated by parts, discarded the. Uh, the, the piece at infinity, this is always convenient. It's always convenient to write this way. And then there is this interaction term. Sometimes I put explicitly lambda coupling in front to emphasize a small. Sometimes I just write it this way. But if you recall from our discussion of Born series, it's not the lambda being small per se that makes the perturbation theory sensible. It's this integral being small compared to h bar that makes the perturbation theory sensible, right? So I'm suppressing h bar here. Right. All right. So this is the action. If you vary it with respect to uh, the field, you get classical equations of motion. These are Euler Lagrange equations. Hopefully, you recall that from part one of the course. And this is what the equations look like in the presence of this. Oh, sorry. I forgot. Oops. There's an important term here that they dropped. There's a source term here. So here's the source term, right? So in the presence of the source term, there, there, uh, yeah, that is not what I wanted to say. Hmm. Yeah, never mind. Uh, this. Yeah, let me put the zero here. Sorry about that. It's actually J here, right? So if you do very respect to that, you get J. So this is the equation of motion, right? The reason is that I have to vary respect to phi. That kills one of these guys. This term just comes down here. You take vary with respect to phi, that you get V prime, right? Um, yeah, and then you vary this respect to phi and you get I think I wrote it really incorrectly. I'm sorry about that. Now it's better. All right, so this is a classical equations of motion. Now, when you write this down, when you when we the 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 Schrodinger Dyson equation that we wrote down at the end of the day looked very similar to this equation, this operator was here. And we know that these derivatives will bring down phi's. This is the V prime, and then this is the J, right? But this is an operator equation. We said that taking these derivatives with setting J equals zero gives equations that, uh, that relate correlation functions, taking these derivatives of this showing your Dyson equation, right? So to make this point a little bit sharper, we focus on the perturbation theory where V interaction with lambda phi four over four factorial. This four factorial is just a convenient combinatoric factor. And then we said the perturbation theory is assuming that this guy is small. Always in physics, make sure when you say something is small, it's dimension less, right? That's important. So we said, after massaging these, this perturbation theory, we said that we, we found the uh, Feynman rules in real space. You have a propagator from X to Y, that's I Feynman propagator. Y Feynman propagator, if you recall, 
one of the neat things about the path integrals was that what popped out of them canonically were was time ordered, right? And the time order propagator is the Feynman propagator, right? And that that's the one that in the momentum space had the I epsilon shift, right? Then, oops. Then for interaction terms like this, we added minus I lambda, right? Let me not confuse you guys by putting this. Okay. Then if we had the source, we're putting it as ij, insertion of something like ij in the path integral. The and then there were symmet symmetry factors uh, that we had to divide by um, to so that we don't overcount. In momentum space, the picture is very similar. You have the fine propagator in momentum space. If you recall for free, for a free scalar for a scalar field, it was one over uh, minus p squared plus m squared plus i epsilon. The i epsilon is there to give the Feynman thing. That's the i epsilon prescription. Now your interactions four legs come in because it's a five four theory. P one, P two, P three, P four. There's minus i lambda, and then this factor is a Dirac delta function that makes sure you conserve energy. Ah, uh, so momentum, momentum, but for momentum, right? Momentum and uh, energy. The symmetry factors are the same, but now every time you have these, these integrals, loops, you integrate over the momentum that runs along the loop, right? Any questions about this part? Okay. Then we talked about connected correlators. We said that um, we, we are inter the actual interactions are captured by connected correlators. I went through this very fast, so I will include a homework problem on this so that you guys work it out in detail. Um, if you do take derivatives del del j of this function, w of j, which is minus i ln of the generating functional, then automatically you get connected correlators. So that's a very, very useful trick. And to just to have in mind, there is a the, the same trick is super useful and it's used in statistical physics, where this is your partition function and this is your free energy. So when you take derivatives with respect to your free energy, you or effective action sometimes well, okay. Let me not <laughs> jump out of myself. Um, you you do get connected correlators. Then so this was very formal, but at the level we did some calculations. We took G2 which is a two-point function of the interacting theory. We expanded it in order by ordering lambda. Recall that every time I say lambda, what I really mean is the first interaction term. And then we said there's a physics, the physics that comes out is called self-energy. So here's the propagator. The first correction, the, the first order lambda correction to it is this. Why? It is definitely one loop. Why? Because you have the, the only vertices you have are four point. Right? So if you want two external legs, you must have a loop. Is that clear? Um, then then there's order lambda squared. And it, it's not hard. I, I encourage you guys to just draw all sorts of diagrams you can draw at higher orders and see what con contributes to what. It's, it's fun diagrammatics. Then when we did the calculation, we showed that there's an elegant way of writing this, so this this interval gives you delta f of z, i delta f of zero. Why? Because it propagator from a point to itself, right? Now that piece is divergent. We said let's not worry about that for now. Renormalization will take care of it. But if we just treat it as just some finite piece, we could view it as a shift in the pole of the propagator, and then we interpreted this as the presence of the interaction shifts the mass. Roughly speaking, the physics of this is that the mass of the free particle that, so a free particle that was propagating with some mass, now there because of interaction is surrounded by cloud, a cloud of particles that interact with it. And that slows it down or yeah. So basically mass is renormalized. The propagation has changed. Now, we looked at the four-point function, the connected piece of the four-point function at order lambda. We found three diagrams like this, right? 
And then we wrote down the expressions for them just as an exercise for uh, the pharma rules. So that was the discussion of the last lecture. Today, we're gonna to be talking about doing the same thing for fermions, and we're gonna discover Feynman rules for fermions, which is basically the propagator. The vertices are gonna be the same, but there's an important thing that happens, and I can tell you in advance. Every time you have a loop where a fermion runs in it, there's a minus sign that pops out. That's essential. That is the origin of many, many important ideas and results in physics. Supersymmetry is one of the things that was born out of this simple observation. The fermions, when they run in loops, there's a minus sign. And that has to do with the fact that fermions anti-commute and not commute, right? So I'm just telling you in advance, keep track of that as we go through it. Good. Any questions about the last lecture? All right. So let's start with fermion path integrals. Now, as you recall, fermions are representation, the, the, the fermions are, uh, we had the spin statistics theorem that told us that fermions are Grossman va valued, right? Fermion spinners came out of, um, uh, what did we call them? Oh my God. Uh, not representation, projective representations of Lorentz group, right? So, um, and then we, we went through how the representation, we, we mentioned that representation of Lorentz group is, is dimension dependent. That's why today I'll be talking about three plus one dimensions. But if you recall, I made a general comment that when you are in higher dimensions, the route to generalize um, the representation of Lorentz group for spinners is through generalizing the Dirac algebra, Dirac matrices, right? So just keep that in mind if you ever end up doing any calculations in other dimensions. All right, so, so because I wanna make sure you guys are comfortable with uh, Grossman variables, we are gonna go through the formulation of gross uh, of quantization of uh, um, fermionic har simple harmonic oscillator. So let me just say in words a little bit. Um, sometimes you hear this that um, bosonic. Sometimes you hear that like okay. So how do how do I wanna pitch this? Um, yeah, anyway, anyway let, let, me not, let me not philosophize. What I, what I was going to say is that sometimes you hear that a lot of physics could be derived from the quantization of a simple, harmo simple quantum harmonic oscillator, right? Now, every time you find yourself confused in some calculation, you, you should always come back to simple quantum harmonic oscillator. But here, keep in mind that there are two versions of it. We rarely teach the fermionic version. We always talk about bosons, but the fermionic version, we went through it earlier, right? C and C dagger, you get anti-commutation relations and the Hilbert space is two dimensional, right? So that is, you can think of that as a quantization of a qubit, if you wish, roughly speaking. Now, that's not literally true, but yeah. All right, so we're gonna go through simple harmonic oscillator, but if you recall the derivation of the path integral, we ended up with a path integral on the phase space. And what we did was we did, an, we sliced the path integral into many, many slices. And on each slice, we inserted an integral over all phi's and integral over all pi's, right? Field and its conjugate momentum, x's and p's. So we ended up with a path integral over phase space. Right, that was that was the point. Now, there is a way of doing the same thing on the phase space, doing the path integral on the phase space, but using variables that are like this. The variables are, you know, your phase space is x and p. Define z, which is x plus i p, and z star, which is x minus i p. I'm just giving you the intuition. So if you just re reformulate your everything in terms of this z and z star 
and run the quantization method, you end up naturally talking about coherent states. So we're going to see that, OK? So from the point of view of the phase space, the distinction I'm trying to tell you is that going from x and p variables to this holomorphic and anti-holomorphic variables, right? OK, how does it work? So you recall that in, in simple harmonic oscillator, you had the vacuum, you had the creation and annihilation operators. You could define the coherent operator, coherent state, sorry, coherent state is e to the power of z a dagger of zero. Now, if you have taken any, I don't know even quantum mechanics, what kind of courses you've taken, but basically these, these states mimic classical particles. They, uh, they minimize uncertainty relations, blah, blah, blah. Right, so they're they're very nice things. They form an overcomplete basis. If you have any ket psi, you could expand them, of course, in terms of a dagger to the power of n. Right, and now if you take the overlap of psi and z, ket z, you're going to get z star to the power of n. That's just a calculation you can do and you will do in your homework. Now, what this means is that you can view your wave function as an anti-holomorphic function on the phase space. Your kits become anti-holomorphic. Anti-holomorphic means function of Z star and independent of Z. Your bras become functions of, sorry, yeah, your bras become functions of uh, holomorphic function, functions of Z. All right, is this principle clear? Now, and your fit, your resolution of identity takes this form as integral over Z, Z bar, integral of Z, Z star, E to minus Z squared. Do you guys have any idea why there is something like this? Because it's an overcomplete basis, you're overcounting. If these guys were forming an orthonormal basis, you would just have to integrate over z's or sum over z's, right? But they're an overcomplete basis, so you're overcounting. Therefore, you have to put something in front. Turns out that the right variable here is e to minus z squared. Now, if you have a normal ordered operator, which is a function, an operator is a of a dagger a, well, you just put it, oops, sorry. Normal ordered recall that means that a is always annihilation operators to the right of creation operators. So they kill the vacuum, right? If you put it inside this, if you look at the matrix elements of them in the coherent basis, this is just A of Z star Z e to Z star Z prime. Oh, sorry, Z prime. So basically this operator could be thought of as a function, the normal order version. This is a very useful way of thinking about how to relate, actually uh, uh, thinking about quantization. In quantization, you start with functions on the phase space, right? And you construct operators, right? Just keep that in mind in, in case you are interested in formal aspects of it. So you will, you'll see this play around with this in your homework. But roughly speaking, in this picture, A daggers becomes Z star and A goes to Z. When you in, Every time you evaluate the matrix elements of these normal ordered operators, they look like functions of Z and Z star. And keep in mind that Z is just X plus IP. So you're going to do this in your homework. But basically what we do is we, if you recall how we calculated, uh, how we derived the path integral, we took the this um, ket f time evolution i and split the time evolution into many, many pieces, right? And then expanded this guy to a first order. We took the limit of delta t going to zero and going to infinity, right? That's, that's how we derived it. And on each... Every, every time we slice it, we insert a resolution of identity. So you do the algebra, and what you obtain is this. You get a path integral over z, j, z, j star. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm reluctant to draw these pictures, but 
This is J, one, two, three, J, right? All the way to N. On each of these slices, previously we were in integrating over values of phi and pi. Now you're integrating over values of Z and Z star. Sorry, I said phi and pi, X and P, sorry. We're doing quantum mechanics. I, I, I keep jumping ahead to here. Sorry about that. Now, here's your measure, right? There's some sort of measure here. And you just do you just do the calculation as you, th this is the bound, these are the boundary conditions. Um, assuming a normal order Hamiltonian, if you recall, that was also something that we had to assume. We find that the, one of these matrix elements, one step of the matrix element could be written as e to the power of z star of k plus one z k, one minus delta a, t, of h of z star k z k k plus one z k that's just because of the fact that the matrix elements of normal ordered operator in uh in coherent energy eigenbases is just a function like you just replace a dagger and a with z and z star so it's a very neat property if you ever care about formal aspects of this this is like uh, example uh, the simplest example in non-commutative geometry. So this is when you take uh, phase space, here is R2 or something, and then you make it non-commutative. This is precisely what you were doing. All right, so here is your matrix element. You go through this story that we've done several times. In detail, you obtain a path integral over Z and Z star. Again, recall that Z and Z star are just your phase space. So this is a phase space path integral, right? E to the power of I, T, I, T, F, D, T. This is the expression you end up getting, right? This expression is like Lagrangian, right? Um, <clears throat> now, this is, the and this bit, comes out because of the fact that uh, you have initial and final wave functions, right? The I and F. So you identify this piece of the action in, as the action. But keep in mind that this is a phase space path interval. So it's not literally, well, not, the, I, I said all I have to say. There's another thing that I, I, the reason I ask whether you guys are comfortable going from Lagrangian to Hamiltonian formal, formalism and back is that here you could see something magical happening. The distinction between scalar fields and fermions becomes very pronounced here. In the case of scalar field, the momentum conjugate was phi dot, right? So you were dealing with phi and phi dot. That was your P. In the case of fermions, the conjugate to psi was psi bar. So it's not related to the derivatives of psi. That's how we ended up with an action, writing an action in terms of these two independent degrees of freedom, psi and psi bar. That, another way of saying that this is intimately tied to the fact that the action we wrote down for um, fermions is first order in time derivative. So the phase space picture, so if you want to compare fermions to uh, scalars, their quantization, they are a lot closer if you formulate quantization on the phase space. That's the punchline. That's what we are doing now. So finally, you obtain the, this uh, matrix element, right? as a path integral over something that we formally defined as a uh, Lagrangian on the phase space, on the phase space, right? And then these are the initial and final, um, I think I dropped, yeah, I think I think I was sloppy, I, I dropped this factor. Yeah, there, there, there's this in here. Yeah. Good. Any questions? So, so far what we did was we just took a um, simple harmonic oscillator and quantized it. 
but using the language of uh, coherent states. So we integrated, we used, we, we wrote everything, matrix elements and the path, in the, we derived the path integral on the phase space in terms of the coherent states, variables. Good, any questions? This is identical. This is absolutely equivalent to the previous set of previous derivation of path integral, but somewhat more elegant. It's more elegant because it generalizes to fermions right away. So to, to see that, we just have to redo what we just did for fermions, but fermionic harmonic oscillator, quantum harmonic oscillator. So that's, if you recall that, the, that Hilbert space is two dimensional. It's like a qubit. You have C and C dagger. Now you define fermionic coherent operator is e to minus c psi dagger, c dagger. One big thing to be careful with, every time you're dealing with fermions, you have to be ultra careful with minus signs because what naturally pops out is are these um, Grossman variables, the orders matter, right? When you change the order, you pick minus signs. So of course, if you remember c dagger, squared is zero, right? Because it's, it anti-commutes with itself, right? Therefore, if you just expand this, you're just going to get one minus C, C dagger. That's also a manifestation of the fact that the Hilbert space is two-dimensional. So this is proportional to the up state, and then this is the down state. Good. This fun, this this beast is a grass, it's a Grassmannian variable. So because we're working with uh, complex Grassmannian variables, you could think of them C1 minus I C2, C1 plus I C2. Grassmannian means that they satisfy the anti-commutation relations like this and they score to zero. You will do a homework problem on this and you will see. Now, if you have a set of them, because you saw that in quantum field theory, what you end up with is a set of simple harmonic oscillators labeled by K, right? What you end up, if you, if you have a set of them, you basically have a collection of these Grassmannian variables. So you get a Grassmannian function, a Grassmannian valued function. Good. That's e to the power of minus I K, C K. Uh, this is, the Grassmannian variable, these are the Grassmannian variables, C dagger K of zero. They have the following properties that you're gonna show in your homework. As is the case with um, coherent states, bosonic or fermionic, they are eigenstates of the uh, annihilation operator. That's one way of defining them. So they satisfy this equation. But the dagger one is like taking derivatives. This is kind of a cool thing the fermionic setup and the overlaps are basically the same here you get c c bar c bar again recall is just a complex conjugate corresponding variable it takes some getting used to but it's really nothing but uh fermionic harmonic oscillator it's a two-dimensional over space any questions So you write down the resolution of identity in terms of these fermionic variables. Not surprisingly, it looks exactly the same as the case that we had before for bosons, right? There was, we had a Gaussian up here, right? ZZ star, here we get the same thing, C, C bar. I've included a collection of these guys, so that's hence the index J, right? Similar to the case of bosons, you can get a path integral by just repeating the derivation that we went through. Now you get a propagator from psi of f t of f psi of, of t, psi of i t of i as a path integral over these Grossman valued fields, psi bar and psi, e to a power of the action. Now the action, this is analogous to the phase space, right? So it's psi bar psi dot minus psi bar dot psi minus the Hamiltonian. 
right? This looks awfully similar to Dirac equation. To Dirac Lagrangian. That's not the coincidence. This equation holds in quantum mechanics and QFT. Because I didn't say anything about relativity here. Right? I just had a collection of spinners. So what you learn in summary is that if you want to generalize half integral formulation from bosons to fermions, it's more convenient to do it um, in terms of coherent uh, in terms of coherent states or these z and z bar variables on the phase space. The distinction is that now you look at Grossman valued functions. Your field and the uh, your field and the sources of the path integral are going to be Grossman valued because they need to anti commute, right? Any questions? Here, uh, I think uh, that is uh, just uh, a kind of a spinless formula. You don't have, uh, yeah. I think the freedom, uh, the number of freedom is uh, not exact as a, a Dirac field. Yeah, um, sorry. Here, here, what I'm what I'm discussing is at the level of quantum mechanics. So I just have a what what I'm dealing with is just some anti-commuting variable. It's a spinner, right? So okay, yeah. If you want to generalize this to higher dimensions right, and you require relativistic behavior, relativity, then you end up with the Dirac action. That's basically the comment I was going to make. Does, it, does that address, address your concern or did, uh, maybe, maybe I missed uh, the question? Yes, okay. okay, thank you. Sure. All right, any other questions? All right, so in summary, once I get, let me, let me repeat, what we do the exact same thing we did for path integrals for bosons, for fermions. Here we end up with the path integral over the phase space. And we do not, we get, we don't get the simplification of by integrating the momentum part. You have a psi and psi dagger and you work with the path integral for fermions in the, on the phase space, right? And, uh, Another comment that I made was that, well, it's, these are Grossman valued functions that you're integrating with. Good. So now let's write down the generating functional the way that we did for bosons. So we introduce sources, of course, they're Grossman valued. And the goal is to calculate a two M point function, for instance, of x1 to xm, y1 to ym. I'm just going to put psi and uh, psi x1 to psi xm, psi bar y1 to ym, right? Do you know why I haven't put any size here? Why I picked this one? Think about that. Well, of course, you could relate them to, get to each other, but yeah. Now, because they're Grossman valued, you know that the correlation functions, these are time ordered, right? Are gonna be anti-symmetric under switching any pairs of these guys, right? We define the generating functional for fermions in the following way. It's the expectation value, the vacuum expectation value of the following source, right? Exactly identical to the uh, bosonic case. We exponentiate, This is these are the sources. There are two sources. One of them is the source for psi bar. The other one is the source for psi. They are like particle antiparticles, right? Differentiating with respect to eta and eta bar brings them powers of psi bar and psi, but 
as I've said many, many times, with fermions, you got to be very, very careful. These differentiations and these uh, rules are about Grossman valued functions. There are signs that you have to be very careful with. So that's a big caveat. But once you learn how to deal with them that you're going to do in a homework problem, then it really, really simplifies your life. So you want to be careful with signs. You take the uh, first derivative of a the bar. So a the and a the bar are the analogs of j. So does anyone know why we wrote j over there and here we have a the and a the bar? Why do we have two sources here and over there we had one sources? So if we wanted to introduce a second source over there, what would be what would it have been an analogous to? So j was a source for phi. If we were on the phase space, we should have introduced a source for pi as well, right? If we wanted to calculate the correlation functions of pi, we should have done that. I never told you that I'm calculating, why I'm not calculating that. Do you know why I was not calculating the correlation functions for pi? What is pi for free scalar field? It's delta of phi. So if you have the functional form for the correlation functions of phi, you just take derivatives. In the case of fermions, you just have to compute them. That's why we introduced two sources. Good. So the key distinction here, every time you find yourself confused why you're dealing with two sources in the case of fermions, actually, in the, on the if you had a fermions are more closer to complex scalar field. Because over there we have particle antiparticle. So if you were doing this exercise for complex scalar fields, you needed a, a source for field phi and a source for phi dagger, the particle and antiparticle. Because you can compute the correlation functions of the antiparticles from the particles, right? They're different. Good. Any questions? Of course. Because we're dealing with fermions and because of this property, we always have charges. So in anticipation for that, you know that there will be in your Feynman diagrams a direction where charge flows. You have to have a have to distinguish between psi and psi bar, a particle and an antiparticle. For free scalar field, it was his own antiparticle, so it didn't matter. So we're going to put arrows on um, Feynman diagrams. Okay. That was a few steps ahead. If you take derivative with just a to bar, this is the source for psi. You get the time ordered psi comes down here. Whereas if you take a derivative with respect to eta, there is an extra minus sign here. These are these are important. Now, if you want to get the time ordered thing psi psi bar, you take a derivative with respect to a to bar and eta. Right. These are the correct signs, but you, you play with them and you learn. Of course, you take to you take to derivatives and you want to set a to equal a to bar equals zero at the end to get the two point function, right? That's uh, what generating functionals are good for. But let me repeat this again. Fermion path integrals are stay at the level of the phase space. Good. Whereas for the boson, we perform the path integral over pi the canonical conjugate and wrote everything in the terms of the field. All right, any questions? Now, showing your Dyson equation, is there an analog of it for fermions? Of course there is. And without going through the derivation, I just write it to you in analogy to the, the, the one that we had for scalar field. What we have here is just the equations of motion, right? Classical equations of motion, where you add also the source, and these are acting on the partition function. Sorry, generating function. You have two of them, one for psi, one for eta, one for eta bar for the conjugate variable, right? So basically, Schrodinger Dyson is analogous to what equations of motion 
are in the world of quantum mechanics. There are no equations of motion, but as operators, so equation of motion is no longer zero. The operator, the differential operator that acts on phi and kills it or are in the field and kills it is no longer true. It's not zero. It's actually an operator, right? And as, as an operator, you could calculate this matrix elements. We did that. And Schrodinger killed it. Sorry, not Schrodinger Dyson is all about the matrix elements of this guy. Good. <laughs> now, your free partition function for, uh, sorry, I say partition function, free generating functional for a spinner, for free Dirac spinner with two sources, A to and A to bar, will take the following form. This is some normalization, integral over psi, path integral over the field psi and psi bar. And here is the Dirac action plus A to bar psi plus psi bar A to. If you recall, the propagator, the free propagator was the inverse of the equations of motion in momentum space because it's a Green's function for it. If that's too quick, you'll get used to it by doing some calculations. So here is, oops. Here is what I'm gonna define in anticipation that this object, the differential equation that defines the equations of motion is the inverse of my propagator. I'm gonna call that S minus one. I define this operator. Notice that this is a four by four differential operator. These are matrix equations. There is the four by four differential operator because we're talking about Dirac fermions in uh, four dimensions. Is that good? Is that clear to everyone? This gamma mu is a four by four matrix. So that's why I put an identity here. How did we calculate this in the case of free bosons? We looked at this and completed the square because these are Gaussian looking variables, right? So here's how you complete the square. Your whole thing looks like psi bar S minus one because I defined it so, plus eta bar psi plus psi bar eta. I write it this way. That looks like completing the square, right? Plus the shift, you perform the integral over this bit. You're gonna get a constant. That, that does the path integral for you for, for, for that by shifting it this way, right? Your final answer is going to be the generating functional for the Dirac fermion with sources A to and A to bar is E to minus I integral of D, D plus one of X, right? D four of X, I'm just suppressing all of that. A to bar S A to. This is to be compared with the boson answer. E to minus I over two, J propagator J. Right, so this is a propagator. Is this too quick? Am I am I going too fast? Are there steps that you have questions? Maybe I should pause a little bit. These are Gaussian intervals, right? You could do, and I think you should do, to build some intuition. So this x s x y this guy is the Green's function for the differential operator. Do you guys know what this means? Well, okay, you, you'll do some homework. I I went through examples of Green's function and the relevance here, right? It's basically basically the idea is that take this path integral this this action this whole thing, right in momentum space. It becomes an algebraic equation. And in momentum space, your propagator is just the inverse of this guy in momentum space. And because you want time ordering, you shift the denominator by I epsilon, that's it. That's the Green's function story. So free, free fermion propagator is this ISF, it's the two-point function time ordered of psi and psi bar as two derivatives with respect to this guy setting eta equal eta bar. Now that we know the expression explicitly, right? We know this z naught eta eta bar, we could do these calculations. Of course, in, yeah, is that clear? 
So you do the calculation. In momentum space, you find the fermion uh, propagator is one over k mu gamma mu minus m plus i epsilon. That was expected. This is the inverse of the Dirac differential operator in momentum space. Is that clear, right? So in what was Dirac operator? It was uh, gamma mu del mu uh, minus m, right? In momentum space, this becomes k mu. Well, there's an i here. K mu or minus i. Del mu minus m, right? And the inverse of it is precisely what I've written. I've added the i epsilon because I want time ordering. Good. So this you could write a little bit more elegantly by completing the square downstairs and writing it this way. Now you recognize that this is the propagator for free boson. There's a relation between fermions and boson. So the 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 spinner two copies of it looks like a boson. We'll, we'll, we'll say that in a second. So in the chiral basis, where gamma mu, these four matrices are written in terms of uh, Pauli matrices, right? Sigma mu and my, uh, sigma bar mu, if you recall, we went through that. This propagator is a four by four matrix that is takes this form. This is the explicit expression for it. Any questions? It's a good moment to pause if you guys have any questions because I don't want to just push through and go fast. So what did we do? We set up a path integral for fermions in terms of Grossman variable functions on the phase space. We evaluated the path integral for free Dirac spinner. The result looked exactly like the bosonic case. It was e to the power of i integral over space. You had psi bar, the inverse of the propagator psi. Right? We calculated the propagator. It's the Green's function for the Dirac equation. It's just one over k mu gamma mu minus m, and there's an i epsilon shift to make it uh, time order. These are four by four equations, right? So Feynman diagrams for fermions. We can draw Feynman diagrams for them, but now we have to add arrows because there is uh, the direction that we have to identify the direction of the flow of charge. We have particle and antiparticle. Fermion interactions is always a matrix, is a Dirac matrix. Keep that in mind, right? It's all interactions for fermions is always matrices. So if there is a fermion that comes in, well, should I, should I say this? If a fermion comes in, how do you write an interaction for fermion and two scalars? If you have a vertex where fermion comes in and there are two scalars, can you write down an interaction? Well, think about these. There, there are like a lot of, a lot of things that you could just based on the structure of Feynman diagrams, these diagrammatics, you could deduce a lot about the kind of things that you can write down. Good. Is, is what I just said clear why you cannot have a fermion with a two, two scalars have an interaction? Because the resulting interaction would be a vector, would be a Lorentz vector. It has to be a Lorentz vector term inside the action. Action is Lorentz invariant. So it, you always have to contract the indices. An example of a fermion interaction is in QED, quantum electrodynamics. So you have a gauge field, photon, that interacts with a fermion and antifermion, and this is the gamma mu. So this is a term you include your interaction in your Lagrangian, your action. 
You can draw it this way. This wiggly line represents the photon. The fermion and antifermion are, we draw them with solid lines, right? But the direction changes. One of them is going towards the vertex, the other, the other one is going outside the vertex, right? That is because of charge, flow of charge, right? And basically the diagram for this in QED looks like minus IE gamma mu as a Feynman rule. Now, in analogy, you learn that electric charge is the coupling in QED. So what does it mean to have perturbation theory in QED, Feynman diagrams in QED? You need small electric charge, right? But electric charge has dimensions. So you're talking about something dimensionless. QED will have a coupling that, think about this number, you might have heard this, one over 137, 137. This is all about the dimensionless number that's relevant in QED, right? That's what, that sets the stage for perturbation theory. Any questions about this? So now we're gonna write down some basics of quantum electrodynamics. We're gonna come back and do a through job. But for now, I'm just motivating using Feynman diagrams using this. So what is QED? QED is a Dirac fermion coupled to a U1 gauge field. Hopefully, by now you know what these words mean. So there is a term in the QED action. I'm ignoring the dynamics of the U1 gauge field for now. That is, here's a fermion, right? This is the Dirac fermion, plus an interaction term, A mu psi bar gamma mu psi, right? This is the photon and this is the fermion. And it's a, this is the gauge shield for U1 charge. Good. You already know how to write this down in a covariant form in terms of the covariant derivative by absorbing this term into the derivative. Right, we went through that in the gauge theory business discussion. An example of a Feynman diagram that is very important and we're gonna briefly discuss is called photon vacuum polarization. This is analogous. I'm, I'm doing this in analogy with this diagram, right? We went through this in the last lecture. It was the shifting of the mass for prescalar, right? Here, there is a photon that comes in. There is a fermion, that an anti-fermion that run in a loop and the photon propagates. That's a diagram. I haven't told you what the propagator for photon is. Therefore, I'm going to treat it like an amputated, the amputated diagram. Recall amputated diagram just meant drop the, all the uh, propagator for external legs, right? Because they just go for the right. The external legs just don't play any role. They're just, they're just there to conserve charges. I guess they, they impose conservation laws, but that's it. So for this diagram, there are two ways of interpreting it. You could interpret this as a contribution to the two-point function of the photo, of the uh, electric potential photon, right? Or you could contribute, you could associate it to a contribution to the S matrix of a photon transmitting. Uh, sorry, photon turning into another. I don't know how to write this down. Turning into another. another photon, right? There's a photon that's propagating, something happens and just continues propagating, right? So let's see what this diagram looks like. Feynman rules. You have some, if you if you want to view it as an interaction, uh, so, something like this. So there's some initial photon state, some final photon state. There are two vertices here and here. Each vertex will put V interaction. There is I E over two because there are two vertices. This half is a symmetry of the diagram under flipping like this. You have two copies of V interaction. Is that clear so far? So it's like Legos. Each piece of the diagram has something, you just put it in there, you copy paste them. 
Good. So what does this look like? This looks like minus e squared. These interaction terms, there's gamma mu and sine gamma nu. Those indices should be contracted with the indices in the state in the in the in this in this one and two. What are these? These are photon states. So they will be contracted with polarization indices, epsilon mu and epsilon nu. You're going to see this later, right? But these are polarizations of uh, photons. So you just expand everything. And I'm just writing the matrix elements of these uh, gamma matrices. These are four by four matrices. So if A and B run from one to four and C and B same. You do this. You have psi bar, psi b, psi, psi bar, psi. This is a four-point function that we have to compute. Good. So let's try to calculate the four-point function. Psi a bar, psi b, psi bar, psi, psi b. I can rearrange them to write them more conveniently, but at the cost of introducing a minus sign because of because you know that you're anti-commuting. I end up with an expression like this, where you propagate from x to, x to y. Oops, sorry. Sorry, that's a typo. You propagate from x to y, bc, and then y to x. This is one Feynman propagator for the fermion. This is the second one, x to y, y to x. And the indices are bc and da. Now you plug that back in. Here's some matrix contractions you have to do. The final result is that the amplitude that we're calculating is minus e squared integral of dx dy, epsilon mu, epsilon nu star. These are the um, polarizations of the photon, minus trace of ISF gamma mu, ISF gamma mu. Trace is in the four by four matrix representation. Good. This is an example of a four point function calculation for fermion calculation of a particular diagram in QED. It's called a tree level diagram because it doesn't have any loops. Tree level means this tree as in it's a tree graph. There are no loops. Any questions about this calculation? This is the very first quantum field theory on a real calculation quantum field theory you're faced with. It might seem like too much, and but hopefully this is the first of many, many QFT calculations that you do. But the principles are always the same. These Feynman diagrams are like Legos. Each, there are rules that you just know, copy paste these expressions inside the integral. You're faced with an awful looking integral. You have to do it. We rarely can do those integrals, but in this course, we're going to be talking about those integrals that we can actually can do. All right. There will be lots and lots of integration. That's just the way life is. Any questions? So what did we do from the beginning? Until now, we define a path integral for fermions as a, Grossman a path integral over Grossman valued functions on the phase space. We evaluated this path integral in the presence of sources for the Dirac fermion and the particle and antiparticle. Sources are eta and eta bar. They're also Grossman valued. We took derivatives to calculate the two point function. The two point function was the propagator. It looked like precisely as it should. It was the inverse. It was a Green's function for uh, Dirac equation. Then we calculated the four-point function for it, and we found that we found this expression. One use of the four-point function is in the evaluation of a particular QED diagram that I drew. Is that good? Any questions?
So a reminder for you guys when you go through these calculations. In the case of fermion, signs are very important. If you did calculate, if you do calculate some, cal do some sort of calculation, like what we just did. Oh, sorry, wait, I, I apologize. I call this tree level. This is definitely not tree level. This is one loop. I, I had in mind I was doing a different caption. This is one loop, right? Tree level means, like, for example, this is a tree level diagram, right? Sorry about that. If you do this calculation for the a case that where bosons run inside the loop, you find a very similar looking expression, but the overall sign is positive. This is a principle that comes out of Feynman diagram. It's a Feynman rule for fermions. Every time you have a loop where a fermion runs in it, there's a minus sign. Good? So fermions loops come with a minus sign. Boson loops come with a plus sign. That is an important feature of um, quantum field theory. Any questions about that? Anything we've set up to here? I'm going to summarize and then talk about the relevance of this minus one a little bit in case you guys are interested. So we quantize fermions using path integrals over Gra Grossman functions. It looked like this. So this is the source for psi bar. This is the source for psi, right? And we found an action. For free drag fermions, this generating functionals, we could write it down explicitly as a path integral. This is Grossman valued sources. We evaluated it. It looked like minus integral of eta bar s, eta, uh, yeah, s, eta. And this is is the Feynman propagator for spin, for fermions, right? We wrote down the Feynman propagator in real space. It looks like this. It's the inverse of the um, Dirac, equ Dirac, Dirac, operator, uh, Dirac equation in momentum space. The i epsilon is for time ordering. The fermion propagator in momentum space could be written this way. Again, nothing funky, but keep in mind that these equations, these propagators are four by four matrices in three plus one dimensions. We also comment on the fact that Feynman rules for fermions requires adding a minus sign for each fermion loop. For bosons, you don't have that, add that. Any questions? So now it's a good opportunity to make a comment about something you might hear, have heard of, supersymmetry. So we, we, discuss, we, we, we discuss bosons and fermions. Bosons and fermions have to do um, with, sorry, I don't want to say this. Yeah, they had to do, when we, when we studied uh, the representation theory of the Lorentz group, we said Europe's of the Lorentz group are our particles. Right, and then we found spin half, half integer, and spin integer particles. The, the spin statistics theorem told us that spin half particles are fermions, and spin one particles are bosons. Now, one general problem that appears in quantum field theory that we've encountered already several times is that loop diagrams come with divergences. Right, so we saw that in the case of uh, for example, if you do this calculation for a boson, right? If something, some boson runs in the loop, you you have to integrate over momenta. That's fun, Feynman rules. And because they're all momenta included, these integrals diverge. We did not deal with this. We said at some point renormalization will take care of it. Now, it's in, it's tempting to speculate about the following. Maybe there is a secret symmetry in the nature that requires for every boson 
there has to be a fermion. If that's the case, as you calculate the loops, each boson contributes a certain amount, but the fermion will contribute the same amount with a negative sign. They have to come with the same masses and same structure. This is the starting point of the speculation that led to supersymmetry. If their nature has such a symmetry, then the calcul these, these divergences just disappear. So they just cancel out and it's all good, right? But this is some, some idea that developed, as, as has deeper origins, but it developed and it's important. You also know another thing that's very important. When you calculate the vacuum energy for bosonic harmonic oscillator, what do you get? You get plus h bar over two, right? If you do that, the same same thing for fermionic harmonic oscillator, you get minus h bar over two. These h bar over twos were the things that led to the infinite vacuum energy. We just pushed it under the rug and said, ah, we're not concerned with it. Now, if you have a symmetry in nature that requires a cancellation between bosons and fermions, that problem will also go away, right? Okay, so enough for um, enough for like more formal theory. In summary, what we discussed today was uh, fermions, path integral for fermions, and we saw that uh, they're naturally formulated at space, space path integrals over Grossman valued functions. Um, we saw that the propagator is uh, precisely what you would expect. It's a Dirac, it's a Green's function for Dirac equation. And uh, because we're doing path integrals, what pops out always is time order. Therefore we do the I epsilon prescription, shifting the shifting the denominator of the uh, well, shifting the propagating denominator by the uh, by I epsilon. And then finally, we con we commented on the fact that if you have fermion loops, you pick up a mi extra minus sign. There was one calculation that, we, that I went over very quickly, just as a simple calculation that you're going to encounter a lot in QFT, an example of QED vertex. Um, uh, sorry, did we do the QED vertex? We just did the, well, I did two examples, right? One of them was, I, I did not really write anything here. There was this. Right, this is QED vertex, and then we calculate the photon vacuum polarization, which is one loop. Just to make sure that I because I spoke incorrectly for, for a second. Um, tree diagrams are when the diagrams you draw have no loops, right? So this is a loop diagram. This is a one loop diagram. Tree diagrams are the ones that don't. I call I was just sloppy, I, I, I misspoke. All right, any questions? If there are no questions, I will probably have to head to the airport now. But uh, one thing that I wanted to say is that I will post the new homework again to, so, uh, later today, hopefully. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to say was that I will post the poll on Slack. Thank you so much, guys, and have a nice day. Bye. Thank you.